Okay. Welcome everybody uh, to the 2014 Davis Joint Unified School District School Board Candidates Forum, sponsored by the Davis Vanguard and Davis Media Access. My name is David Greenwald. I am the Executive Director of the Davis Vanguard, and I will be the moderator for this forum. Um, we have, by agreement, uh, drawn uh, numbers uh, and determined that Barbara Archer will begin. Uh, each candidate uh, will give a two-minute introduction uh, addressing several key points, what attributes are necessary to be a successful school board trustee in Davis, how will your past service to Davis schools inform and prepare you for serving as a school board trustee, and what qualities do you have that are different from the other candidates that will serve you well if you are elected. Um, following the two minute opening remarks, each candidate will uh, answer all of the questions uh, one by one. Uh, there will be five questions. They have been submitted by the candidates themselves. We have grouped and uh, uh, determined uh, that these are the five that are going to go. Uh, we have also been passing around cards. In the second half, after a brief five-minute intermission, we will go through the cards and uh, the candidates will have an opportunity uh, to answer probably between eight and ten for a minute each. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. We have a full audience, uh, so obviously we're not going to be able to take everybody's question, but that's the way it works. Um, so um, without any further ado, um, Barbara, you're on for two minutes. Um, and once again, uh, white card means 30 seconds, red card means stop. Barbara. Okay, good evening everyone, and thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you to the Vanguard and Davis Media Access for uh, providing us the opportunity for this forum. Uh, we've been asked to address a number of points in our opening statement. First, how does our school service uh, thus far inform and prepare us for serving on the school board? So what I'd like you to know about me is I've worked in our schools for the last 10 years. I was PTA president at Willett Elementary, <laughs> and I served on the school site council. As PTA president, you are responsible for a budget, you answer parent concerns, you work with site staff on projects to help students success. On site council, you help manage a budget and you discuss school climate issues. This is very relevant experience for the school board. In 2012, I co-chaired our school parcel tax campaign. For this, I had to learn about the DJUSD budget. I had to know what Measure C funded and what it did not fund. I have followed our budget issues closely ever since by attending board meetings and also by serving on our district parcel tax oversight committee. I think how our budget is managed and prioritized is the, the most critical issue we face in the next few years. We were also asked to talk about what attributes we have that will be necessary to serve effectively on the school board. I'm a strategic thinker. In my public relations background, I am trained to look at a scenario and think about the different ways an issue could go and plan accordingly. I'm also a good listener. I enjoy talking with people and hearing their concerns. This was something I did a lot of in my parent leadership positions. By nature, I'm a very open person. I value honesty and transparency, which I think are essential qualities in a board member. In addition, I'm responsive. In PR, you always respond to a journalist as soon as you can after you've done your research. And I would view constituents this in a similar way. I would respond to your concerns as soon as I Thank can. you, Barbara. Alan? Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming out tonight. And thanks also to the Vanguard and Davis Media Access for organizing today's event. It's very important that a forum like this uh, exist in such an important election. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, I am currently on uh, the board and serve as uh, your trustee. Um, uh, the attributes uh, that I have uh, leading up to my ultimate appointment on the board um, are that I have a deep uh, commitment and um, extensive volunteer 
uh, efforts, not only in our school, but in our larger community. I came to this community initially for education as a student at UC Davis, and I've remained here uh, for the purposes of education uh, in, in raising my own family. Uh, I've been here over 20 years and have uh, uh, committed myself to public service and serving our community, be it uh, on school site council, a member of the strategic plan uh, committee for the district, uh, as well as uh, other uh, uh, activities not related uh, exclusively to the schools, but other parts of our community. Because getting to the point of what makes a good school board member, I think it's one that has broad vision of all of the different uh, communities within our community and ensuring that our children are educated uh, to the best of our ability requires us to have a broad uh, knowledge of the strengths of our community that we're able to tap into. Um, I'm excited to be on the board. I'm, um, I'm the newest member to the board and uh, look forward to continuing my service over the next two years uh, and uh, am committed uh, first and foremost uh, to getting our district to improve. All though it's um, widely known as a great Thank district. Thank you, Alan. Be better. Okay, Jose, you're up. I have uh, been a teacher for 32 years. Uh, I am a professor at the California State University in Sacramento, and I lived in Davis for 36 years. From the very beginning, I served this district as a parent-teacher volunteer. Um, our, our family is one of the first families that founded the Spanish immersion program at Birch Lane, then at North Davis, then at West Davis. And um, I was also part of the technology task force that put the first computers in the district uh, um, appointed by the board. I, um, I think the third question is uh, the most important to me, and that is what, what, how you make it different. I have given a theme to my campaign as to become the three T's candidate. The first T is technology. I want to make sure that Davis uh, schools become the most technologically advanced in the United States. I practice that in my own courses. I am at the forefront of uh, becoming and proposing the paperless classroom and using technology to teach with iPads, iPods, whatever the kids uh, enjoy nowadays uses as tools for teaching. The second T is taxpayers. A taxpayers' responsibility, I, I am a candidate that I believe uh, the taxpayers can trust because I have also uh, opposed the parcel taxes when they are not needed. I am not opposed to paying taxes, but when you have uh, four measures in 18 months, you gotta say no at some point. And the last T is teaching. I want to support the teachers. I am one of them. I am with you. And I want that the, the kids receive the best education. That's how I am different from other candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Uh, my name is Michael Nolan. I'm a, uh, 20 years ago, my wife and I decided that when we raised our kids, we were lucky enough to have one of us stay home and take care of the kids and I became that one, so I became the homemaker. And that gave me the opportunity to get really involved in my kids' uh, schooling at, in the Davis school system. I'm an attorney by profession, a member of the, the uh, public law section of the State Bar. But at the same time, uh, when we had four kids at Willett at one time, uh, the PTA president told me, uh, you have to get more, more involved in the PTA. And so I did. I became a member of the Superintendent's Par Parent Advisory Committee for five years. I eventually became PTA president, and I served as chair of the school site council. Uh, in those capacities, uh, I learned a lot about the schools, and, uh, uh, and, under the, uh, and in the Superintendent Parent Advisory Committee, I served under f the last four superintendents. And it gave me a, a broad experience in our school system working on the PTA and the site council, working with different people and bringing to con a consensus. And I found that the most important thing is to listen to people. And as a board member, I believe that that's the most important thing a board member can do, 
is to listen to everybody. And in our district, what's really important is that we're not, many other districts are just a majority vote district. In here, we have to have a consensus in the community because every four years or four or five years, we have to go, the board has to use its credibility and go before the community and ask for needed taxes to keep our uh, uh, high achieving schools. I want to be that board member. I want to listen to you, and uh, it would, uh, I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bob. Good evening. I'm uh, Bob Poppingay. Thank you, David, and David, Davis Media Access. So uh, the first question was uh, how past service to Davis schools would inform and prepare me for the school board. Uh, I think probably the, one of the best ways is that you have children in the district. I have two daughters, very diverse. Uh, one daughter came to our family uh, as a 10-year-old and is an English language learner. And we have another daughter who is in the AIM program. So I've seen two very diverse programs and how the, the district uh, manages those programs. Uh, I also participated on the professional development action team as part of the strategic planning process. And I was actually shocked in Davis that there was really no program to uh, train, help train our teachers and keep them trained. And I think uh, that was a very collaborative and very fruitful process. And now we have a professional growth system. Uh, I've also brought uh, educators to the community to look at best practices and best evidence. And I think I've seen uh, through interacting with some community organizations specifically explore it, how those organizations interact and leverage our resources in the community to help educate all our kids. Uh, as far as attributes uh, that I think are necessary to be a successful school board trustee, I am a university educator, have been for 25 years. I've been very student focused. Uh, as a school board member, I would keep that focus. Uh, the school board member has to always keep the child uh, at the top in terms of consideration. Uh, I think I'm a good listener and observe uh, things that go on. I want to spend time on site in classrooms as much as I can. Uh, I am a lifelong learner and I think this is very important because the educational literature changes quite dramatically and I think it's incumbent upon school boards to, to keep up with uh, what uh, the latest uh, information is. And I think you have to think strategically uh, you can't be thinking. Uh, Thank you, Bob. Okay. Um, I want to remind everybody to make sure you're speaking into the mic so that uh, uh, the TV people at home uh, can hear what you have to say. Uh, Chuck? Okay. Good e evening, everyone. Uh, Chuck Reardon, thank you, uh, Vanguard and Davis Media, for hosting this event. Uh, among the attributes that make a, an effective board member, I believe, are a collaborative work style and the ability to consider many diverse perspectives and to bring that together in a, at least a cohesive uh, solution and approach to solving uh, whatever issues are before the board. Um, I've worked for 20 years on complex, um, high visibility public works projects uh, as both a team member and leading multidisciplinary teams. Um, I'm used to a high level of accountability and, um, and also I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of uh, transparent and open proceedings. Uh, I think that's one of the best ways to uh, advance a particular idea or um, whatever the issues are to at least give it its full and, and, and just hearing. Um, as someone who's not an educator but who values education, I think I would bring uh, a different set of uh, views to the board. Um, I'm the first member of my extended family to uh, earn a college degree and I think that also uh, provides the, and having to work through the education system and realize a lot of its benefits and figure out a lot of that for myself without a whole lot of mentorship. That gives me uh, some insights that I think uh, would also help complement the other points of view on the board. Um, I make an effort to inform myself on the, uh, the current issues and the kind of the long view um, challenges and aspirations of the district. Uh, I served on the strategic planning committee uh, and I think that was an excellent example of what you can see when people from diverse walks of life come together and uh, work together and figure out what, what the, the future course is gonna be. Thank, Thank you. you, Chuck. Uh, Madhavi. 
I'm running for Davis School Board because public schools are the engine of opportunity in our democracy. I myself am the beneficiary of public schools. My parents immigrated to the United States with nothing. Public schools prepared me to attend Harvard College and then later Stanford Law School. And today I proudly teach at a public school, the University of California Davis School of Law, where many of my students are the first in their families to go to college. My scholarship of the past two decades has always focused on expanding opportunities for all, from gay rights to women's rights to ensuring access to knowledge. My book on intellectual property and global justice is used in classrooms across the country. My record of service to the Davis schools began well before my own two children, now in elementary school here in Davis, were of school age. In 2005, I led the campaign to name Korematsu Elementary after the civil rights hero. Today, Fred Korematsu's quote, if you have the feeling that something is wrong, don't be afraid to speak up, empowers kids in that school to stand up against bullying. Last year, I participated in the school district's strategic planning process, focusing on how to support the whole child. We highlighted there the need for small classrooms as one key to supporting each child's needs, and I am committed to uh, reducing class sizes. I'm endorsed by the Davis Teachers Association, the Yolo County Democratic Party, State Senator Lois Wolk, and all five members of the Davis City Council, and hundreds of community members. I believe, one, we can and should provide a world-class education to our students, even in an era of limited public support. Two, this means we must spend our money wisely, concentrating our resources in the classroom, not on unnecessary consultants. And three, we must be resourceful. I have a proven track record in bringing in grants from Google, the Carnegie Corporation, and from the public sector. I will seek partnerships with foundations, corporations, and universities to bring opportunities to our kids. Thank you, Thank Madhavi. You. Okay, Tom, you wrap up this first uh, set of questions. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Adams, and I'm running for Davis School Board. And I just want to thank you all of, all of you for coming out here tonight and participating in this civic uh, uh, situation. As a Davis School Board member, I would bring together a number of qualities that I think are needed. One is I'm a, I'm a known consensus builder. It starts with listening, clearly defining the issues, looking at all sides of the issues, emphasizing the we and not the me of the issue, and making sure everyone contributes. I have knowledge of the schools based upon my site council experience at Emerson and Chavez, and I also have served on district-wide committees for the Spanish Immersion Master Plan, as well as the Davis uh, School's uh, Strategic Planning Committee, the Assessment Subcommittee. I have deep knowledge of education policy. I've been involved in education for 22 years. I also wish to bring a positive attitude to Davis in terms of recognizing the great uh, things that Davis teachers do while recognizing the need for change and improvement in other areas. I also seek a balanced education for all students. I believe in all services to all students, such as counseling, the arts, humanities, science, and career technical education. For me, it's this experience, K through 12, is the time to foster curiosity and provide a variety of experiences. In terms of my experience in education, um, it's not simply 22 years, but 22 years involving curriculum and instruction and assessment. I got my start in assessment, and I've graduated to curriculum and assessment. I mean, instruction and curriculum and instruction. In terms of the rules of governance, I just want to say I'm the executive director of a commission, and I know how to make meetings run, how to make sure policy decisions are done in a consensus fashion, and that it, in the end, everyone can say they've had their input. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so here is the first question. Alan, you are going to go first on this. Um, and once again, uh, one and a half minutes rather than the two minutes for the uh, first one. What is your philosophy of education and how will it shape your decisions on the school board? Are there issues where you have disagreed with the administration in the last two years? If so, what are they? Minute and a half. That's mm -hmm. one question. Okay, <laughs> uh, okay. My, my, my philosophy on education, um, particularly as a trustee, uh, of a public school district is access. And um, 
uh, truly making sure that all 8,600 students of our district are served uh, to the best of our ability. Um, from the child uh, on free and reduced lunch to um, the high achieving student to everyone in between. And so um, access is sort of first and foremost uh, uh, upon sort of my, uh, my core philosophy on public education. And then of course, with regard to our district, uh, achieving excellence um, with, within our student population and, and driving every student to their highest potential. Um, with regard to the uh, question on administration and whether or not I have disagreed, sure. Um, within the last two years, um, I don't know that I go, you know, two days without disagreeing uh, at times, but I think what you'll find from me is that um, I am a good listener, I'm a consensus builder. Um, we do have challenges uh, in our district um, and uh, it's really important that uh, we shouldn't shy away from disagreement from our administrators. Um, rather, we should look to build consensus with our students in mind. Um, I, I think, frankly, the question is... Thank you. Jose? My philosophy uh, on teaching, because I am a teacher, my first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that everybody learns. And while not everybody is an A student, we need to care for those who need help. And that is the mission as I see myself in my own classes. That's the mission that I would see the teachers in their, in their classes. As a trustee, we need to support them to give them all the materials, the training that they need to be the best teachers that they can be. And of course, this um, touches on two of the T's that, uh, that I have mentioned my campaign is based on. One is the technology to give the teachers the best tools, and the other one is the support and the training for them to do so. That I disagree with the board, yes, particularly on the uh, fiscal irresponsibility of the board. Uh, it goes from increase to salaries of administrators to 3.4% uh, to four measures in parcel taxes, which I think is basically an abuse of the taxpayers. If that money is not going to, to be effective in education, we have a budget of $70 million and those taxes are only like 4.2, and to make everybody believe that that's what holds Davis education, that's Thank you, Jose. Correct. Right. Mike? Uh, thank you. Here I am. The um, state constitution since 1849 has given the legislature the power to create schools, but the words they use are common schools. My philosophy is, yeah, I believe in common schools. When they use that word, the common in the sense of community. And I believe that everyone in this school district should be able to uh, go to a public school and achieve their full uh, capabilities and have the full range of services offered to them. My, so my philosophy of education is that, that we have a chance in this school district in a, with, a, with a consensus of the community to really offer our kids a, a top-notch education, whether they will go to college or whether they just want to go to a, a work or a community college. My uh, disagreement with the school board, uh, in the uh, aftermath of the, um, of this, uh, of the uh, resignation of one of the board members, uh, the uh, board adopted a conflict of interest policy, which I believe is inadequate, totally inadequate. And I believe that what we need in this district for the school board to have credibility is a tighter and more explicit conflict of interest code that would make sure that the board operates on a fair, open, and focused manner. Thanks, Mike. Bob? Well, I think it's uh, important to point out over the last uh, several decades, I think our public school systems have been asked to do more and more, and often with uh, less resources. Uh, so that makes uh, educating all our kids uh, a, a real challenge. Uh, as far as a uh, philosophy education, I think it has to be student-centered. Uh, that's what I've done over the last 25 years at the university level. 
And I think it's very important to engage students in the classroom. I think in this country, uh, there are a number of studies that say our high school students uh, uh, disengage from the educational process. And I think part of that is making sure that we have excellent teachers uh, in the classroom that are adequately supported. Uh, I have a philosophy of education, academic excellence, and high expectations. I think all our students benefit from high expectations, uh, even those that are at risk. I think they perform better. So uh, public education is not a, a zero-sum game. I think we have to figure out creative ways to provide opportunities for every child. <coughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah. Chuck? Thank you. Um, pardon my voice, I'm a little hoarse tonight. Uh, my philosophy of education is really about providing the full range of options uh, available to the different styles of learning and aptitudes that are within the student population. Um, I think that that's important so that each of them are able to develop to their full potential and that um, you know they can rely their own particular interests and uh, aptitudes and, and pursue those throughout their, uh, their school careers here in Davis. Um, also something I'm very much interested in is inquiry-based learning. I think when the, the, uh, the mode of learning comes more from the, the student themselves or is more interactive and is generated from the questions in their minds as stimulated by the teacher and other environmental factors, I think the, uh, the uh, process is much more enriching and I think that starts a, a lifelong love of learning as well. Uh, in terms of issues with the current administration, I would say that um, better and more active communication before the fact. Uh, I have seen improvements along these lines, but I think in recent history there have been several instances where it was more about damage control and the community not knowing what was going on until after things were apparently already decided. So uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, the key issues I have. Um, but again, I have seen uh, personally good. Thank you, Chuck. Madhavi? So my philosophy of education is support all children. The public schools make each one of us our brothers and sisters keepers. And that means that if we see a child thriving in any of our schools, well, that makes us happy, even if it's not your child. And if we see a child suffering in any of our schools, that that concerns me, even if it's not my child. That's my philosophy of education. Um, in terms of uh, disagreements with the administration, well, I, I definitely think that the problem with the volleyball episode uh, last year went far beyond the fact that we didn't have a conflict of interest policy. We spent $22,000 and countless personnel hours investigating a complaint involving a board member's child. This really could have been handled and should have been handled differently. We could have gone to an administrator from another district to look into this without spending money. We could have had a committee of parents and teachers without spending the money. I think that we really need to um, look at how the district is spending money. We spent over a quarter million dollars in four years on um, 11 investigations. That's not gonna happen on my watch. When I'm on the board, we're gonna spend our money on things that matter, and that means nurses, counselors, and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Madhavi. Tom? Uh, thank you. Uh, my philosophy of education comes down to the concept of the uni universal design for learning. We have to begin every class and every instructional situation where we know we're going to have all kids there at the beginning. In this sense, we have to be open to a variety of students. The other thing we have to do, though, is have common standards for all students and common expectations, and this is important because we want to make sure that kids who graduate from Davis schools actually have the same knowledge and skills we expect. However, we also have to have a variety of programs, and that's what Davis offers, and, and I want to see continue to offer. Just as we have neighborhood schools, we also have schools that are specialized in their function. Also, I want to just say that when it comes to our, our students, we have a lot who are college ready, but we also have to, a lot who have to be career ready. And in that sense, we should take a look at these programs and make sure they're open to all students and we don't track one into the other, but they all enjoy each other's company. In terms of disagreeing with the board, I think that it comes down to the fact that the board had to make some hard decisions during tough budget times. What I want to see restored is class size reduction. 
I want to see regular counselors. I want to see regular school nurses. I want to make sure that our teachers are well trained and can actually get professional development on a regular basis. And more importantly, I want to see the board reach out and rebuild trust with the community. Because it's not the board, it's Thank our board. Thank you, Tom. Board. Barbara. Well, my um, philosophy of education um, goes to uh, enrichment for all and open access to all programs. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a great music program in Davis, as you all probably know. Um, but when we say access to all, what I mean by that is um, are the forms for the music program in Spanish, do we have a translator at those meetings so uh, families who uh, speak another language other than English can uh, learn about this benefit for their child? So um, open access is really um, important for me. And, and I believe we can be a model district in so many areas. Uh, we're known for you know good test scores, but I would rather us be known for uh, a model district closing the achievement gap, uh, state-of-the-art technology, uh, community service. That's what I want us to be known for. And yes, I have um, disagreed with um, a variety of expenditures um, made in the last two years. Uh, and I would seek much more oversight uh, in terms of what we spend money on because we ask an awful lot of our community and we need to be um, transparent and fiscally responsible with our finances. Thank you very much. Okay, that is question number one. Uh, question number two will go to Jose. Uh, if you are elected, what is your top priority and what is your plan to accomplish that priority? I think it goes to the, I know the one of the T's, that's teaching with high technology and support of the teachers. Those are the highest priority. I will not put priority in raising the salaries of the administrators at the expense of the teachers. I think the time has come where all the investment in the past that they have been on pay raises and pensions and all that needs to go to the children, to the students. And the investment in technology and for them, investment on the, um, for training for the teachers. How will we achieve this? We need to rethink the priorities and if we set that as a goal, I think every, all of us need to be engaged in, in that goal and see how we can achieve that. If we need external funding, I am all for that. I am all for the seeking and perhaps creating a department that is specifically is dedicated to obtaining grants for a specific purposes to enhance those two T's. Thank you, Jose. Mike, you are up. My, my top priority is to listen to, the, uh, to our community and to listen to everybody. Uh, not only the people that are the um, uh, supporters of our schools, but even the critics, to listen to our teachers and our students, to listen to our parents, uh, in order to form a consensus to support our schools. The, um, what I want to do is work with the other board members here, at least two of the others here and the other, uh, or, uh, and the, the, the other members, to make a consensus that we have credibility to go before the voters and ask uh, uh, for the public support for our schools. The um, other point is to, uh, and the point of listening, is to be able to advise the superintendent and the school administration about what public opinion wants and what we're concerned about. And I think that's really an important aspect of a board member. What I also want to do is make sure that no board member uh, has uh, uh, no board member uh, uh, goes off and tries to manage things on their own. That they remember that under the board bylaws that the board, uh, a board member has no uh, individual authority except as it's authorized by the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bob. Well, I think uh, I would actually have a, a couple of different priorities. I, I think uh, restoring uh, trust in the uh, school board and the business they conduct is very important. I would like to see a community like Davis have a process where, as a community, we can get together and discuss some uh, controversial or divisive issues. And I think we've seen some evidence of 
issues cropping up all of a sudden without a lot of community input. Uh, one that comes to mind is the uh, consolidation of the high school with the ninth grade uh, that just sort of hit the papers and there was no process there to engage the community and uh, get their feedback. Uh, another priority would be teachers. We're going to lose about 50% of our teachers in the next four or five years. In fact, this year we just hired about 90 new teachers. Some are inexperienced, some are not. So I think we just have to ensure that they have a professional growth system that meets their needs. And lastly, uh, another priority is we need to develop strategically our, our partnerships with institu institutions like uh, UC Davis, uh, the, the City Council, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. That we have so many resources in this community that we are not tapping into to help leverage resources and improve our educational programs. And I have just one minute to go back to the other question about what I disagree with, with one situation with the board. And I was very disappointed when new monies became available that they hired 3.6 new FTEs for the administrative office. And I think that should have been done over a Thank you, of Bob. Time. Chuck. Okay, I think uh, my highest priority would be making the choices and having, or coming up with a plan that actually aligns the district to be a 21st century leader in public education. I think a lot of different things would go into that. Uh, but some of the main components, I think, would be making some serious headway on closing the achievement gap. I think the recent development of the, uh, the LCAP and a lot of the features of that plan is going to make some significant strides in that direction. Um, I think also having the, uh, the full range and open access to all the different types of educational components and options within the district is going to be key to, um, to broadening those, those choices. Um, I think also, as Bob had mentioned, that uh, taking care of teachers and staff, um, those, those folks who are most entrusted with, with educating our kids and their development in the formative years, um, you know, if we aren't able to attract, retain the most uh, highly qualified talent, or at least quality talent, that's a cost that's going to have downstream impacts well into the future. So that's something that's becoming a very pressing issue and that we really need to get out ahead of. Uh, otherwise, it's going to cost far more in trying to reverse some of those impacts. Thank you. Chuck? Uh, Madhavi, you are up. Okay. So my first priority is classrooms. Reducing class sizes enables us to meet the needs and recognize needs of every kid. Um, we have a lot of issues with respect to mental health issues um, and learning uh, needs that are sometimes not addressed or even identified because the class sizes are so big. So smaller class sizes, also small learning communities. So as we get into the upper grades, programs like Da Vinci offer kids alternative uh, learning opportunities in smaller environments than the uh, DHS does. The second priority would be teachers. Supporting teachers is one of the most important ways of supporting the kids in the classroom. That means rigorous training, especially now in light of the Common Core, uh, but it also means recognizing their concerns about s facilities and safety and security issues. We really need to listen to teachers and support them in these many ways. The third priority is resources. Davis aspires to be great. We are all about schools here, and we have shown that we are number one in so many different ways, but that means we need to seek partnerships actively with UC Davis, our world-renowned university in our backyard, but also nonprofits and the, the corporate sector to bring the kinds of uh, opportunities in science, but also in language and the arts that we need to prepare our kids for the jobs of uh, the, the 21st century. Thank you, Madhavi. Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to focus where I can focus. As a board member, we really have to build. My priority will be building those board meetings and making sure that they're an example of civic virtue. Some of the things I want to do, I want to start every board meeting with at least a five-minute presentation by students. We've got to remember who we serve. We're there for the students. We, I also want to make sure and take the Office of Public Information Officer and change it to an ombudsman. The fact of the matter is, Everyone knows how great Davis schools are, but really the way we're going to make Davis schools better is by restoring trust. And instead of having someone telling people how great we are, maybe we need someone who can actually help parents find out and get the resources that they need. I want to also say that really it's about listening. If you're going to be a board member, you better have big ears, is what I say. Uh, 
Um, you know, you got to be patient with people and listen to their problems. And I want to make sure that it, we always don't just listen to those who are at the meeting, but those who are interested but can't make it to the meeting. In that sense, we have to reach out to, for lack of a better term, the silent majority in our, of our parents, staff, and teachers. Thank you, Tom. Barbara, you are up. Well, um, my um, key uh, issues, issue is budget priorities. Um, 10 years ago, a student entering kindergarten had 22 kids in her class. Last year, uh, she had 32 kids in her class. This year, we've been able to reduce class size at primary gates to 25. We still can do better, and you know we still have 40 kids jamming into a classroom at the high school. So uh, class size is still a big priority for me. Um, counselor ratio is, um, is something that's critical for us. Um, our counselor ratio, 7 to 12, is um, 350 students to one counselor. And uh, at elementary, they're paid for with, with soft money by PTAs. We need to have a sustainable means where students can see counselors um, when they need to and that they're not funded by soft money. Uh, my other priority would be teacher compensation um, and teacher input into policy. And if I have time, also uh, technology with proper training and a plan for sustainability. We can get all the iPads in the world, but if we don't have training on how to configure them and to deal with you know, technology obsolescence, then uh, it, it doesn't work to have um, that technology in hand. So we need proper training. Thank you, Barbara. Alan, you wrap up this round. Those are all great top priorities, but you can't do any of those priorities without one thing. And as the board member who was appointed as a result of the resignation, I'm committed to restoring trust. And how do you do that? The question is, what is your top priority? Mine's to restore trust in the community. And the question says, how would you do that? You do that by being transparent, open with your decision process, inclusive, listening, and telling the community the facts. And here are the facts. 80% of our funding generally comes from the state. The decisions up until the local control funding formula have been dictated by the state. The state is not investing in public education any longer, okay? We are 50th out of 50 states in per pupil spending. That is not, unfortunately, at, try as I might to increase that, I'm not counting on that going up. So therefore, we need to really tap into our community and, say, and, and ask the community what kind of schools we want for our future. And our community is not going to be willing to invest in our public education without restoring trust. And I'm committed to that because, frankly, it's a necessity. With our parcel tax funding about almost 10% of our budget and coming up for renewal, there are infrastructure needs that, are, uh, are, that have gone uh, years without deferred maintenance that our district is finally catching up on. And building that trust with our community is the way we're going to be able to get to all of the wonderful things that you Thank heard. you, Alan. Okay, we are now halfway through this first round. Um, I wanted to uh, give a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you to Davis Community Church for this facility. Uh, second of all, thank you to Davis Media Access who has donated their work and labor tonight uh, to broadcast this to the community. And I also want to give a shout out to Jeff Hudson for uh, covering this event. Thank you. All right, uh, question number three, and uh, we're to Mike Nolan now. Um, DJ USD has been questioned about the legality of the lottery used to determine classroom placement for the AIM Gate program. What is your position vis-a-vis -vis AIM Gate? The, uh, the issue that came up before the board was uh, 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 brought forward by the attorneys uh, because there was a question about the legality of the old way of putting people into the, uh, uh, the gifted and talented uh, alternative uh, model of education. And, um, you know, as a, as a member of the state bar, 
I have to say that uh, the, uh, the attorney's uh, uh, advice was pretty well sound. And unfortunately, the criticism uh, didn't see that the California Constitution requires a higher standard than the federal Constitution when it comes to equal opportunity. So that when a person or child is determined to be in the, in the program, then everyone has to have an equal chance to get into a classroom size. I think that the, the program is an important part of our school district. I think it meets a need for people in the uh, area, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, opposed to it. But what I do want to say is that it has to treat people fairly, and that all should have an equal chance to get in. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bob, you are up. Well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I have a different perspective on, on the lottery. Um, actually, I was at the school board meeting when they discussed that, and what disturbed me was that there were no options or no alternatives that were discussed. Uh, it was strictly, we're gonna go with the lottery. And I don't consider that fair because we do have recognized tests that we're giving to these students. Uh, they do rate them based upon those tests. Maybe those tests are imperfect. Um, you know, I'm not an expert in that area, but I know of a situation, uh, a colleague had twins. They both uh, tested into gate. One was accepted by lottery, one was not. That's not fair. And so I would have liked to have seen a lot more discussion with regard to alternatives. Thank you, Bob. Chuck, you are up. Yes. Um, I think one of the, the key issues I'd had with the lottery and how that was... Uh, arrange is that this notion that uh, statistically, so you, we have these objective tests that, that determine who gets into the program, and yes, granted, they're not, they're not perfect, but one of the, uh, the, the ideas put forth was, well, a 94 percentile is really no different than a 99.9 .9 percentile. And at that point, I, I think, you know, it's like, well, what's the point to begin with? Um, and you know, for someone who's in extreme need of an alternate approach to education, say in that, the, the far reaches of that bell curve, to basically be excluded by random drawing, I think is a fundamental flaw of the lottery. So all of uh, the issues and, and concerns associated with that process, I think just on, on that basis alone, it was a flawed approach. And I agree that the fact that no alternatives were, were put forth is, is also indicative of what I went back to before in terms of a lack of communication and, and open deliberations. Thank you, Chuck. Madhavi. Well, I've been uh, campaigning in the community for a few months now, and this topic of AIM slash GATE is very much on the minds of many, many people, and I've had lots of conversations with parents, principals, administrators, uh, and kids about this program. Um, and, and what I've heard is that we have concerns about things like the lottery, that's one. Uh, so there are some kids, this is um, began as a needs program, a need-based program, and there's some kids who have high demonstrated need, but then because of the lottery, they don't get a seat in the program. But there's a lot of other concerns that go beyond the lottery as well. There are climate concerns around the program. There's concerns around equity uh, with respect to all special programs. Um, I guess I want to say this, that I am open to respectful, uh, engaged, uh, a deliberative dialogue, including considering alternatives to any of our programs that, that, that where we think that the benefits, we, we need to you know, look and balance the benefits and uh, the costs. I would do so under these principles. One, resources must be equitably distributed to each child. Every child should be treated with respect. These are kids in the programs. When we talk about these programs, we need to always remember that. Every child should be taught at their level as well. Each child should be challenged and enabled to grow in the public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Madhavi. Okay, we go back over to Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, the question really is, if a student has certain needs, should they be denied them based upon lottery? And I don't think anyone really agrees with that. I think when it comes down to it, if a student is identified with certain needs, that they really have, we do have to serve them as best as we can. So the principle of lottery, um, you know, it's been used in other things. It's been used in Spanish immersion um, as well. But the reality is this, there's, 
is Davis has a lot of different students to serve. And the question is whether we really have the resources to do it. And one of the things is, is if we don't uh, build trust and reestablish our uh, relationships with parents and, and make sure we have mm -hmm. a good um, uh, community support for the schools, then we're not going to get the parcel tax passed in two years and we won't, and we'll just have that fewer resources to do. So it, in my sense, I think the lottery probably is not a good solution. It might be convenient, say, for certain people uh, in terms of selecting which students, but the reality is we're committed to serving all students. Thank you, Tom. Barbara. Uh, well, I, I would too was at the school board meeting where um, this decision was handed down, and to be blunt, I, I did think at the time that they might be um, trading one lawsuit for another. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, the community conversation around this issue uh, has been going on a long time, and my hope is that uh, the new board can uh, talk about it um, in the in light of you know best practices, review of testing modalities, um, and come up with a solution that um, you know satisfies everyone, and we can you know build a consensus about it. Um, but I I was concerned about this um, you know uh, particular uh, happening at a board meeting. And you know, perhaps we you know, uh, need to see how other districts do it and uh, review the legal decision. Thank you, Barbara. Ellen, you're up. So I think I really like the way Tom phrased it because that's uh, really the crux of the problem. If we're in a position where we have to choose uh, to implement a lottery system, to give some children uh, or to meet the needs of some children and leave the others out, well then, we're focusing on the wrong problem and we really have to focus on how are we going to serve all of the children uh, and meet all of our children's needs. And so, um, certainly, I, I, you know, a lottery is not the best way to go about um, selection into a program like AIM or any others. If a child, needs uh, a particular program or is better suited for a particular program in our district. So I believe that we do need to have a more uh, broad view of uh, our current program and be open to ways that we can ensure that we're meeting the needs of all of the children in our district. Thank you, Alan. And Jose, you wrap up this round. Um, I always say, I am very direct and I want you to know me because of that. I think the idea of a lottery is a bit crazy to do the selection. I think that um, it denies people equal opportunity. And um, being a member of the Hispanic community is very sensitive to us because uh, many of us um, have had to work very hard to where we are and we need to get the opportunities that we have. And I believe, just as uh, when I'm against something, I also propose a solution. So I, I think my experience in living overseas, perhaps in this case, comes into place. I know schools overseas where they have a program like this, but they have like a preparatory period for the students where there's no selection. That means anybody who wants to be challenged and believes they want to go to that program can get in. If they pass that, then they get to the full program. I think we should throw the lottery out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jose. Okay, um, we are now to Bob. Uh, question number four. How would you, as a trustee, ensure openness and transparency in school board deliberations and decisions? Well, I have a, a, a few suggestions, and uh, I don't purport to, to have all the solutions. Uh, I think it goes back to developing a community-wide process for being able to openly and transparently discuss issues that are important to the community. And uh, I think that that's uh, going to be critical to uh, avoid conflicts and divisiveness uh, as we move forward. 
Uh, just some very practical things. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually have uh, played around on the district website and tried to find anything. Uh, particularly when it comes to the Board of Education, there's a lot of information there, but you can't type in conflict of interest and come up with, uh, with a whole lot of information. So it takes uh, a lot of effort. I would try to, to revamp that. Uh, I would like to see Board of Education meetings that are only for information purposes, that we could bring in some experts to educate the board and educate the community. Um, I think uh, it would be nice we have these two by two meetings. There are two board members that uh, liaison with the city council. There's two board members that liaison with the university. I'd like to know what they talk about. You know, they do it because of the Brown Act. It's not a public discussion, but I think that ought to be, there ought to be some summaries of those discussions so we know what they're being, uh, what's being talked about. Thank you very much. Okay, Chuck. Uh, I, I think one of the, the key ways to ensure that openness and transparency is, first of all, having the, the district having a pretty clear idea of and plan of where it's going. And I think the strategic plan was a, a positive step in that direction and provided some kind of framework and uh, you know, uh, programs and, and improvements that the, the district wants to seek and, and are at least a, a uh, kind of a tentative timeline in the uh, kind of the long view. So having that plan first and foremost and then what it is that the district wants to or is choosing to tackle within that particular time frame and making sure that they're getting out in front of it and understanding, depending on the nature of the, the, uh, the change or the improvement or, or whatever the case may be, that you know, there's an assessment made. What's the level of controversy? You know, who are the different stakeholder groups? Um, what are the sensitivities involved? And make sure that there's a plan for getting that word out and letting the community know, as, as being all stakeholders, or, and especially with folks in, with kids in the school, what's gonna be involved and what's gonna be discussed. So having a more proactive approach to just getting the communication out and letting the, the uh, community know where the district is, is going and how they intend to, to make progress in that direction. Thank you, Chuck. Madhavi. Okay, well, um, this is the first time I've ever campaigned. And I have to say I'm awed by the political process of campaigning because it requires you to go out there into the community, listen to as many people, and have your ear to the ground. One of the things I've been doing is I'm taking a schools tour. I'm visiting each of our 20 school sites. I've uh, visited, at least initially now, 17 of the 20 schools. And I think this is really important to be accessible uh, and to have conversations with people if we want to talk about transparency because transparency is about building trust and having these conversations. So when we talk about things like training teachers, rigorously training teachers, we need to talk to teachers. Well, what, how uh, well do they think the training is going now and what do they think they need to do differently? Differentiated instruction, another hot topic. We need to talk to teachers. Technology, well, it sounds great to have all the fancy Chromebooks and all that, and I'm glad we do, uh, but we also need to talk to teachers about what they need to, to create new uh, curriculum to, to actually use it effectively. One of the things I've heard is that every single elementary school principal says we need counselors at the elementary school. So I think that we address transparency by having conversations so that people don't think decisions are just coming on from above uh, uh, without the input of the community and the, the people in the schools, the teachers and administrators. I think things like, you know, you hear on August 25th, right, the American Academy of Pediatrics says we should start middle schools and high schools later, and then when you hear a decision made quickly, Thank you. It, it, it causes hey. issues. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Tom. Um, my experience as an executive director and a state level board is that transparency, openness and transparency is easy to be done with notifications. You can fulfill the law quite easily. You can put your agendas up there. But if you're really about openness and transparency, it's, it's also anticipating what are the issues out there. You have to do long range planning. You have to do a year long agenda and knowing which months issues are gonna be coming before your board and how you can anticipate the discussion on that. 
And once you do that, then you can actually strategically start reaching out to the community, to those people who are affected. Not just waiting for them to come to the meeting itself, right? And how many people can give up an evening like this? We have to reach out to them. And that would be teachers, that would be uh, staff, that would be administrators, that would be parents, and yes, even students. So for me, that's the, that's the key to openness and transparency. But then you also have to explain not make it a wish list, but understand the choices that are before you. And what are the restrictions and confines that you have to work within. And then you also have to be honest about them when you have to make a decision. Because sometimes you run out of time, just like I'm about to right here. Um, <laughs> and you have to just say, people, it, it, we got to decide this month. But we, with long range planning, everyone should know the clock that they're working under. Thanks, Tom. Barbara? Uh, well, I'd like to note that DMA does provide us some transparency. I'm an avid recorder of school board meetings, so that's a nice service offered to our community. Um, you know, it's it's important to note that you know, especially in closed session deliberations, you know, there are rules uh, governed by Ed Code and the Brown Act, and um, so there's that you know piece of it that we need to be um, aware of. That you know, uh, sometimes. Uh, decisions and, and subject matters are in closed session for a reason. Um, but I do agree that um, we need to make a openness and transparency a top priority to rebuild community trust. And as such, you know, we need to give the community adequate notice for community feedback. Um, I, I'm thinking of an example where um, there was a strategic plan meeting where, you know, I saw it in the paper two days before it happened. Um, and so we, we really need to get things on the calendar um, soon because everybody's busy. Um, and, uh, and accessibility of school board members uh, is also part of that, being you know, open to discussing uh, rationales for decisions. Thank you. Alan? So as a trustee, you know, I have continually made myself available uh, just throughout the town, be it in public open office hours, which I will continue to do. But as a trustee, I would also encourage our, my colleagues on the board to also open themselves up to have regular and continuous office hours for the community to come in. I think Tom makes another great point with regard to transparency is important. Uh, and, and one of the ways to achieve that is through long range planning because that gives the public a heads up on where we're going. You know, um, it's very easy to, um, you know, uh, take issue with hirings for administration for a public information officer, yet criticize the district for not having a, a better website, which I agree, the website is terrible and we have to do something about it. But we also have to be fair and acknowledge about what time we just went through with the recession. We went through an enormous time of constriction and now we're going to have to rebuild. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to be open, transparent, and give the public a long range plan and notice of where we're going, and then be committed to being open ourselves publicly. Jose. Um, the openness that we have right now is uh, you get to a board meeting and they give you three minutes to, uh, to do anything you want in there when it's basically useless, when they have already decided what to do, and that's the kind of openness we have. I would like to change that. And the way I would do it as a trustee, I would like to get down to the level of the schools, the teachers and the administrators, and I would uh, do my mission as a motivator, as a, as a professor to um, motivate the students to study science, engineering. I've been blessed with a smart wife who accompanies me sometimes to make these presentations and, and use those opportunities to talk to the teachers, the administrators, and the parents. I have been doing this with the Boy Scouts, with the Girl Scouts, all these groups, and it's a wonderful opportunity to see exactly what the parents are thinking, what the kids are thinking, and that way we, we can, if you're accessible that way, you don't need the three minutes, you'll, you'll talk to me right there. All right, and uh, Mike, you get to wrap up this round. Um, as, a, as a parent for 15 years in the school district, from 1999, uh, my uh, two oldest children have graduated. They went from DPNS to high school.
graduation. And my daughter is a senior at the high school and I have a ninth grader at Emerson. I remember quite well getting a phone call from a parent saying, did you know that there's a school board meeting on Sunday morning at eight o'clock during a three-day weekend? What? I said, how is that possible? I said, it was posted on the door. It was just posted. And it's not at the city hall. It was at the back room of the school district. And they're going to discuss closing one of the schools. <laughs> you know, so a dozen of, of us uh, went down and uh, 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 attended that meeting. And I just felt the, the uh, I felt the uh, lack of transparency very clearly then. And I will not allow that to happen. The second thing that the, um, uh, uh, I mean, that was one, one, one example. They have a, a, a number where matters come up. Uh, Alan says a long process. There was a, the board had a long process about uh, school board, excuse me, school site district boundary changes. And it went on and on and on. And at the last minute at the board meeting, just before Christmas, they changed it completely. And I only became aware of it because I was at the board meeting. And the problem is that we need to have Thank an you, open Mike. board. All right, uh, we're just about to get uh, to our last question this round. Um, I just wanted to note that uh, this is our third candidates forum we've done this year, and, and today the weather has been the, by far the coolest of anyone that we've done, uh, which is a pleasant change, uh, especially after the last week. Uh, so uh, who are we to? Uh, Chuck. Um, uh, this is question number five, and after uh, this round of questions, we're going to take a brief break and then figure out uh, which of the audience questions to ask. So if you still have a question that you haven't written out, please get it to us in the next 10 minutes or so. All right, Chuck. Uh, given the fact that Prop 30 passed in 2012 and measures A, C, and E cumul cumulatively, are in effect until the end of 2016, do you think a new parcel tax measure should be placed in front of the voters at any time in the next four years? I think now with the, uh, the passage of Prop 30 would be perhaps a good time to pause on additional parcel taxes and to take a real hard look at the budget and see with the improving fiscal picture where we can better apply some of our uh, in increasing resources. And once we get a better handle on that, uh, then consider, and, and I think also it goes uh, back into establishing trust and confidence in the board and the management of our limited resources. So uh, with a hard look at the budget and then establishing some of that trust and confidence, I think uh, we could then be in a position to go out and perhaps ask for some additional support. Uh, and I think it would need to be tied specifically to the types of improvements uh, that, that those funds would be associated with. I think there would be an expectation of high accountability for how those funds would be spent. Uh, but I, I think for now, we need to proceed without asking for additional um, funds from the community and, uh, and see what we can do with, with the, the new improvement. Thank you. Madhavi? Alan talked about this earlier, but uh, you know, California public schools are in the most challenging period that we've ever been in. We are ranked dead last, as Alan said, number 50 out of all the states with per pupil funding of $8,500 per child. The top states are spending $19,000 per child. But in a district like Davis, where we're well off, we get less than the state average of $8,500. We get about $7,700 per child from the state in Davis. That means it is our parcel taxes that make up the difference, and they bring us to about $8,700 per child. They are still only bringing us, but thank God they are bringing us to that $8,700, which still is a, a very challenging number. So we need the support of the community, but that is why this election is so important, because that means the community has to have confidence again in the leadership of our schools, in what our schools are doing, and how they are run, how every dollar is spent. We need to have wise uh, uh, oversight of the spending of our dollars, not wasteful uh, uses on unnecessary consultants and things like that. So 
Thank you. Thank you, Madhavi. Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to reinforce that point about local control funding formula. Davis is not a winner in that game. Davis actually has to make up for the deficit on its own resources. So in that sense, for us to talk about ending parcel taxes at this point means we're going to be back to reduce services, and that would be uh, one of the worst things we could do for our kids. When I was going to the orientation for um, Davis uh, school board candidates in the spring, I asked Bruce Colby, I said, do you remember 2007? And he said, yeah, and I go, that was the time when we had great, uh, we had pretty good funding for schools, things were on the up and up, we had uh, pretty good uh, student-teacher ratio. I said, at what, when, at, when can we expect to return to that level of funding that we had in 2007? You know what he said? 2021. So that's our local viewpoint of things. Does it actually think that we have a lot of excess money or it's coming our way? I'm sorry, it's just not that case. But we can make a commitment among ourselves to make sure that we get the resources that our kids need and let's make sure that they get the services that they need and it's not caught up in adult games. Thank you, Tom. Barbara. Uh, I'd like to correct the question, if I may. Measure A has sunsetted and it became Measure E, which I know is confusing. So right currently on the books, I believe, we have Measure C and E. Um, and they um, total $9 million of funding. As Tom said, in 2007, we were doing all right. By 2012, we had lost $10 million and we were facing massive layoffs, we were facing libraries closing, K-12, the elimination of elementary science, the elimination of elementary music, the uh, you know, increase in class size. So I sure as heck don't wanna go back to the time when we um, were looking at a $10 million loss. Um, the, um, this is not fluff stuff. And you know, I'd personally like to thank the community. Um, Measure C, which was our last um, big parcel tax, which, is, which accounts for $6.5 million a year in funding, uh, that passed with a 72% majority in our community. So really, it's a community choice. And Davis chooses libraries, Davis chooses music, Davis chooses science. Thank you, Barbara. Alan. So I think Madhavi did an excellent job of actually talking straight, giving you the exact facts of what our figures look like, folks. And Barbara also sort of highlighted uh, more to the point of the dollar amount the parcel taxes represent vis-a-vis -vis our overall budget. So to the question of do you think a new parcel tax should be placed on the ballot within the next four years? Absolutely, because the things you just heard about, about reducing class size reduction, uh, increasing our counseling, which by the way we did in this last budget, an elementary level pursuant to our LCAP, we're not gonna be able to do any of those. We're gonna have to regress without a parcel tax. Yes, there are ways to ensure that we're getting the most out of our dollars. But let me tell you, we experienced the, the greatest constriction of our district that we, I think, have seen any one of us in, in this room has seen in quite some time. And so, uh, I'll, as to the point of long range plan, plan that a parcel tax will be on the ballot within the next four years because if it's not, the kind of schools we are all talking about building uh, for our kids is, is, is um, gonna be a more difficult reality to achieve, if not impossible. Thank you, Alan. Jose. I think the only answer that has been sensible has been Chuck. Everybody else is displays the problem that I try to point out. It's like they are addicted to parcel taxes. At some point, they, they need to be responsible to the taxpayers. The question I would challenge anybody who, who has been in favor of these taxes is to even in their own kids as a whole in the schools, what difference have they made in their child? And very few people would be able to answer any with any positive. I believe that the board needs to take a look, a hard look, and, and, and be truthful to the community. If you tell the community that this is a temporary tax, then don't come back and renew this and keep doing it since 1980. I am not against the taxes. I paid those taxes since 1980. I have lived in Davis 36 years. But I, at some point, we need to respect the taxpayers. We do, we do not have to be treating them like an ATM machine every time that they run the budget in the red. Thank you, Jose. Mike. 
what I learned about school finance in my, in my experience is that uh, the legislature has built something like a Winchester mystery house. You have, you have rooms and hallways. It's all designed to hide where the money's going. And the point is the money goes primarily to the big districts in the state. <laughs> the, it goes to the big districts in the state. There's a thousand school districts and 40% of all the kids live in one of them. And so, and so the, I talked to Colby, Bruce Colby, a friend of mine. And the point is this, I've known him since, uh, since, he, be, since he was hired. 20% of our unrestricted funds comes from the parcel tax. Now, the, the point is we have all this money come in, but the legislature, there's always plenty of money to build, a, to build a facility. There's plenty of money for new textbooks, but the legislature has traditionally restricted those funds. And the, uh, the, the new funding formula gives more money to those districts with higher uh, English learners and poor economically challenged. And Davis doesn't meet any of that criterion. I talked to the um, assistant county uh, superintendent of schools, and this, uh, all the districts around us will get more money because they all have a higher, uh, because they meet that threshold requirement, except Davis. So the, the idea is that, and the, the point I want to make about the parcel tax is that because it's limited, only four or five years, but the money that's raised here is spent locally. It is a real engine for our economy. Okay, now it's time. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there on that one. All right, Bob, you wrap up this round. Well, you know, one of the, one of the uh, things that a school board member and a school board needs to do is advocate for public education. And I'm a strong believer in public education. And when you look at the alternatives to what happens if kids aren't given a quality public education, the costs are tremendous. So I think if you keep that in mind, uh, our costs are pretty, pretty modest, actually. Uh, and as others have said, California is not known right now for being uh, near the top. It's near the bottom. Uh, so I think we have to recognize there's a lot of competition, f competition for our tax dollars. I mean, the city of Davis is uh, uh, in a little bit of trouble, too. So. You know, I think our needs are very great, and I think it goes back to establishing a, a level of trust uh, in the community that uh, we're watching the dollars that we're spending, that we're putting them where they're most needed. I mean, I would love to see some extra money go to summer enrichment programs for at-risk kids. I mean, I think that's critical. Uh, and I think the district also needs to look at its facilities. The facilities are really not in very good shape. So that's uh, not conducive to a good learning environment, and those facilities being old probably cost a lot more in terms of energy. And uh, I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so we are now going to take about a five to seven minute break. Uh, very brief, don't go too far. Uh, and then we will be back with the real tough questions. Thank you to the candidates uh, for, for volunteering to serve the community. They don't get, they don't get a lot of compensation even if they get on. Uh, so this is a labor of love and it will be a lot of labor and hard work. So thank you very much. Um, so, um, and also thank you to the audience. I know some have left, but a lot have stayed here. Um, commitment to this community is tremendous. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to get to everybody's questions tonight, but we're going to do the best we can to address as many different types of issues as we possibly can. Uh, so uh, we're going to speed this up a little bit. Um, Madhavi, you're going to be up soon uh, uh, first. And I, I'm not going to do that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you, you get one minute to answer the questions. Um, so, Madhavi, uh, you're going to be up first, um, and, and then we'll go back to Tom again. Um, if elected as school board member, what would you personally do to support LGBT students, parents, guardians, and employees? Oh, great question. 
again, I think it's, it, you begin with the philosophy of supporting all students. I have uh, had the privilege of visiting a class at Emerson Junior High. It was a leadership class led by uh, teacher Jennifer Tara, who's a rock star teacher. Uh, and um, I heard from the kids in that class about the struggles of LGBT students in junior high and how these kids are learning to support each other, to stand up, to uh, uh, create cultures of inclusion. So I think I would begin by, by learning by, about the programs that we actually have, um, having conversations, talking to teachers and parents and um, community members here. I'm working, uh, uh, I have the privilege of having uh, Gloria Partida on our campaign team. And she has started the Davis Phoenix Coalition and they just launched a new campaign called Hate is Not a Davis Value. So um, creating uh, these conversations and communities is absolutely uh, a, a okay. one of my main commitments. Time, uh, Tom, you are now up. Hi, I just want to say that uh, in the California Department of Education, I worked in help passing uh, SB 48, the Fair Education Act, and actually worked with the superintendent and legislative leaders on that. I want to say this about LGBT students. First of all, we always have to guarantee their safety in schools. That's has been in law, and now we have to go to the next step and actually make sure that they see themselves in the curriculum both in terms of national figures and state figures, but I also want to see it in terms of local figures. There are local leaders here who are still around who have helped uh, improve this issue, and then there are also leaders in the past who we need to acknowledge that have contributed to Davis. Thank you. Barbara. Uh, I think the key is um, student forums to bring awareness. Uh, I think um, the district uh, this year uh, started um, educating students re with regard to transgender students, and I think uh, that's important. And I've um, been really uh, happy to see in my own uh, experience at junior highs that a, a number of students uh, could uh, come out and be welcomed and supported. Um, that's not to say, you know, that the opposite experience can't happen. Obviously, it does, and and we need to do everything we can um, to uh, make sure that everyone's included um, and that all our students feel respected. Thank you, Alan. So I. I I want to echo the points Madhavi raised and Barbara. I think that you know uh, we have to uh, exhibit uh, a culture of acceptance and inclusion here, and it's uh, looking, as Tom said, at the leaders within our community, not only political leaders but pioneers. In fact, I see a couple in the audience on this issue, but not only LGBT. I would say that there are other communities within our student population that also need this same type of acceptance, access, uh, and those including race, mixed race, uh, and others. And so we really need to be focused on uh, a culture of inclusion uh, and, uh, in our district, and not only with regard to assemblies, but also within our uh, normal school day. Thank you. Uh, Jose. I had touched a little bit um, before on the issue of equality. And I believe that everybody deserves to be treated the same, not any differently or anything special. But um, I would say just like zero tolerance for bullying. Thank you. Mike. I agree with what, what's been said here. The, um, uh, we have a, under our state system, this com we have compulsory education. And these kids are, we owe a duty th to them that they are protected and that they are not bullied or harassed, that they feel free and safe in our school. I was uh, six years in the School Positive Climate Committee at Willett. We addressed these issues. And I, and I as a school board trustee, I will uh, be uh, very critical of the uh, uh, administration on this. Uh, I've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I mean, a critical oversight for the, uh, by the administration in the district office, but also at the school sites. I believe it's incumbent for the school board members to, to visit the sites while they're a member and to see and to ask the questions about what's going on in every school and every program in this district. Thank you. Bob. 
Well, obviously, a, a positive school climate is, is critical. And uh, in my reading uh, about school climate programs, one thing that comes across pretty clearly to me is that they need to be student-driven. Uh, the students are invested in these uh, school climate <clears throat> programs, and those tend to be, uh, I think, more successful uh, than if it's more of a uh, top-down approach to, to school climate. Um, I also think that the district really needs to, and this ties into a positive school climate, not necessarily uh, uh, the specific topic uh, that we're talking about is restorative justice programs. And I think those have shown great promise in terms of uh, uh, improving relationships among students and seeing uh, different uh, things from different perspectives. And we have a, a very large uh, LGBT uh, component to our students at the Benary School. I'd actually like to see the university, maybe uh, some of those uh, individuals help mentor some of the younger kids. Thank you. Okay, Chuck. Okay, I, I think in addition to uh, fostering a, a more inclusive uh, school climate, I think building a sense of uh, solidarity amongst the students that to where students can intervene on behalf of other students that are being mistreated for whatever reason in particular here, their, their orientation. And, and then from there, I mean, there should be a kind of a stepwise approach along the lines of the restorative justice where, you know, a, a kid may have uh, certain influences in, in their life that are not necessarily healthy and they are being uh, molded by those influences. And, and so I think counseling and a uh, combination of restorative justice, and at some point, um, you know, you have to kind of toe the line. Um, and I think ultimately it's one of these things that takes time to build, and then as that, that uh, culture of inclusiveness builds, then eventually the, the problem of these isolated incidents get rooted out effectively. Thank you. Okay, uh, so second question, rather than reading this long prelude, um, I'm, I'm just going to skip to the question, which is, uh, are you in favor of moving the start of the school day to 8.30 or possibly 9 a.m.? Tom, you're up. And I'm assuming that question is actually focused on high school students because that's Correct. been the discussion, and yes, I would support that. But I'm not going to flip the switch tomorrow. I'm not elected till. Uh, November if that happens um, and also it wouldn't be just me but I would support the efforts there it seems to be a reasonable thing it seems to it may create some inconvenience for us but it do something that we really want to do which is put kids first and we need to make sure that they get the sleep that they need and let, why not follow the recommendation from the Amer American Pediatrics Association thank you Tom Barbara yep more sleep is good um, I think that uh, <laughs> for all of us. Um, the AA, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not make recommendations lightly. Um, there is solid science on this issue and I see no reason um, why we can't adjust our schedule slightly uh, because the benefits uh, could be amazing for our students and we must be student focused. Um, the data that, um, the, uh, that Ann Turnus Bellamy wrote about talked about a decrease in depression, a decrease in car accidents, an increase in academic performance. It seems, um, you know, what more is there to say? Alan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to take a cautious approach to this because um, it depends what we want. You know, starting later, if it comes a company to extending the day at the other end, may not be a bad idea. And the reason I say that is because um, I have lived in Germany and in Switzerland and other places where education is a very high priority in those countries. Some of those, they start before eight even, but they leave at five. So I think, uh, you know, if we were really, we don't want to shortchange the students and the time that they need to learn, but the starting date might not be an issue. Thank you. Mike? I would take a, I would take a cautious approach, only because um, while, the, uh, while I respect the opinion of, uh, of get, going to school early, it, the, the, under the present circumstance, if you don't think your child is awake in the first period, don't 
take a first period. You can always go to school second period, and I know that because my kids did. And so there's a, so we have the, uh, in, the, in junior high and high school, you can do that already. I would say this, that when you deal, when you touch on the minutes, we're under strict guidelines by the state for minutes of instruction. There's a school district down in uh, Southern California that changed the bell, bell schedule by five minutes and the cost of the school district was assessed seven and a half million dollars down at Chino. Because that what they were five minutes short, it didn't count as a full day. So I would be very cautious about changing the, 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 the uh, bell schedule. Thank you, Mike. Bob. I, I personally think it's a no-brainer. I mean, if, if there's one thing that could be done uh, where there's overwhelming evidence for a positive effect, uh, this is it. And uh, I, I just don't see any reason not to. Uh, certainly, we could o open it up to discussion. Maybe there's some pros and cons. I think that's a, an important thing to, to do before you make that change. But uh, I really don't see any reason uh, not to proceed. And uh, I, th I think it also extends to junior high students as well. OK, Chuck? Yeah, I would agree in terms of the, uh, the 7 through 12. Uh, primarily, not, a, not only because where they are physiologically, but um, you know, they're more able to get to school on their own means. And for the, uh, the primary school students, I mean, the earlier start time might make more sense because you have parents that need to shuttle their kids to school, and they may be a little less uh, susceptible to, to the impacts of not getting enough sleep, or, or at least the, their sleep schedules are more flexible. So I think as the, the kids go into the teens and they're able to get themselves to school on their own for the most part, that makes more sense. Uh, but then as we've heard tonight, there are other considerations taken into account. Thank you. Madhavi. Well, as the American Academy of Pediatrics said, this is a pressing public health issue. We have to take this seriously. The well-being of the children is our primary concern. I would ask that we have a task force of parents and administrators and teachers look into this to see how we can make it happen. What, while of course, as Mike says, meeting our legal requirements, uh, but but focusing on the how, not the you know rejecting it outright. All right, thank you. Um, okay, um, this is one of the toughest questions to have to ask, uh, Barbara. Uh, you're going to be on the receiving end of this one. Uh, the Daniel Marsh murder trial has been in the news the last few weeks from school psychologists and counselors to bullying. Daniel utilized the school system a good deal. In your view, in what ways did the district services fall short in attempting to help Daniel if you feel that they did? And would you, uh, what would you do to help prevent future tragedies? Uh, well, I've read the coverage like everybody else, and it is, in fact, a tragedy. Um, I've been visiting a lot of PTA meetings, and in fact, uh, I've been asked this question a number of times already. Um, it's obvious that um, this boy um, has, you know, severe mental illness, um, and uh, he, um, you know, his care, um, you know, seems to have, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say slip through the cracks because uh, it seems like from reading the coverage that um, what he reported was not actually, you know, what he was feeling inside. And so it would be hard for people to make a judgment as to, um, you know, what to do if they didn't have the facts. Um, and also, I think what we read and what we hear at the trial. Um, you know, is not necessarily all the information. Um, I think that it just highlights the need for crisis counselors. Um, in January through April. Thank you. Okay. Alan. Do I get any of the time I saved on my last answer? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, here, let me just say it this way. Uh, I said uh, definitively yes to the previous answer because really, as Madhavi said, the health and well-being of our children are of paramount importance. If we don't have healthy, and I would add happy students, we're not going to get the outcomes we need. Look, uh, the, that question, frankly, is, is far too complex for me to answer in the next 30 seconds, or to opine, frankly, 
on who did what. But it's very important to note, I do support more counselors. We have guidance counselors. It's very different than the type of counseling that we're talking about here. And so that's why I support a parcel tax, because we can't make the investments that we're going to need to make to ensure the health and well-being of our students. And we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Jose? Well, I agree with the counselors. I don't agree with the taxes, and I don't see that relation. But, but I believe that um, we need to have people who who can recognize these problems. You know, mental problems are difficult to identify, and um, we do need those specialized counselors to to avoid this kind of tragedies. Mike. It's a real tragedy. It's a tragedy in our community. Um, my kids went to school with him, and they all said they knew he, he had some serious problems long before this event happened. But what we needed more, we need count, counselors are overworked at the high school. And uh, we all know that uh, young men in their, in their early or, or late teens, that is a very difficult time for, uh, for them growing up. And I w believe that, um, and it, again, it's just counselors, but it also is uh, psychotherapists. We, we have a duty to take care of our kids, even the least of them. And uh, I feel that uh, uh, we could have done more. We should have done more. And we are going to have to do more because, as my kids say, there are plenty of people like him at school still. Thank you. Bob. I, I think more counselors at schools is uh, necessary, but I think it's uh, insufficient to prevent a situation like this. I think we really have to look at wraparound social services within our schools and actually taking advantage of county and city agencies that have more of a presence in schools and having a network where these uh, kids could be referred for more extensive uh, intervention. And uh, I think that's really the only way to, to handle it. Thank you. Chuck. Uh, so the question, uh, did bullying contribute to this situation? I think that's a, a fair assumption, but I think there's a lot more deep-rooted uh, deep rooted issues going on here, and I think we're seeing even at a national level that uh, this is not just limited to here locally. This is almost a national em epidemic, and you know, to the extent that the people closest to them, um, you know, that what they knew and, and, and when and could they have, have mentioned that to somebody and, and I think finding ways to intervene in non-intrusive manner uh, to, to try and head off some of these situations. Are you going to, to catch them all? No, but I think just paying attention and, and letting people uh, know that can, can intervene and, and hopefully get some help for, for the kid I think is, is important. Thank you, Madhavi. I want to reiterate, Chuck, this is absolutely a national epidemic. The Surgeon General has said that some 21% of kids ages 9 to 17 struggle with mental illness. And how are we to identify needs? The fact is there are many unmet needs in our schools. Our schools are absolutely implicated in this. We, I mean, in the sense that we're on the front lines. That's where the kids are. So we need to be looking at how we can address this. One way is smaller class sizes, where we can have teachers in classrooms more able to identify needs and, and, and see where we can go. But we also have other challenges today, the, or it was yesterday or today, the enterprise um, uh, wrote that we have three nurses in our district for 8,600 kids. So um, we need to focus on making these nurses and more counselors available and having smaller class sizes to help identify these real needs that we know are out there. Okay, Tom, you get the last word on this one. Okay, I'm not going to comment on the trial just because it went. Um, but I will say this. Um, mental health is key for all students. Um, and we have to realize that just like we take care of the physical health of our students, we have to for mental 
Um, in terms of schools and counselors, yes, that can help, that can start things. But the reality is this, if we're gonna be serious about mental health of our students, it has to be a coordinated policy with city and county resources. And so, in essence, if we're going to hire those counselors and have them deal with these issues, let's make sure they also plug into the rest of the resources of, of the city and county. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so this is gonna be the easiest question, and I just want it to be a yes or no answer, and Alan, uh, you already have this format mastered, so uh, <laughs> you will go first. Uh, do you speak Spanish, yes or no? No. Um, Jose? Si, sí, con mucho gusto. <laughs> Mike? Very little. Bob? Chuck? Poquito, and yes. Madhavi? No. Tom? My daughter says it hurts her ears. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara? No. Okay. All right. Um, we have about 20 minutes. Um, so what I'd like to do is actually reduce the time down to 30 seconds, and I realize uh, that that's not going to do some of these topics justice, uh, but with eight candidates, I, I'd rather cover a little bit more. Um, so, uh, Jose, um, do you believe that DJ USD has an achievement gap? If not, how do you propose we keep it that way? And if so, what concrete steps do you suggest DJ USD take to address the <laughs> achievement gap? In 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, I, I have had a dream since the um, school board decided to uh, talk about the grand uh, property. Why turn, not turn it, that into a tutoring center so that these achievement gaps could be reduced? Mike. Well, I, I would just say that to remember that the achievement gap is a test score discrepancy between groups of people. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, the, the, I, my teachers would have said, uh, a, a high test score achieves nothing. It's, what you, it's, a, it's a good indication. But what you have to do is, achievement is something more than that. We have, um, the way to address the uh, test score discrepancy is give more aid to those individuals and those groups that need the help. Thank you. Bob. I think there's definitely an achievement gap. It's a problem that this country has struggled with uh, in our public education for two decades, and uh, it's, uh, it's worth a lot more discussion than, than 30 seconds. Chuck. Yes, a uh, persistent achievement gap, and I think the, uh, the LCAP would be an excellent vehicle for fleshing out those uh, steps that we can take in a lot more than 30 seconds. Madhavi. Public preschool for kids who can't afford private preschool, so kids don't start out already behind just when they're entering school. Um, engage families and kids. Engage them with things like our Family Resource Center at Montgomery and other programs that I'm seeing at the junior highs. Two-way bilingual immersion, a great program for meeting the needs of English language learners, getting them to have strong literacy skills in K through three, and high expectations for every kid. Uh, we can't have cultural biases. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Tom. Yes, Davis does have an achievement gap, and it'll get worse if we don't renew our parcel taxes. <laughs> Barbara. Uh, of course, Davis has an achievement gap. Uh, we need to make sure hungry kids are fed. We need to make sure that support services are in place, and we need to uh, make sure we have the proper outreach to those populations. Alan. Yes. Um, I think we need to be holistic about our approach on this on the front end, as was mentioned, universal preschool for those uh, kids that can't afford it, but on the exit of our district, which is the older kids and uh, instilling programs like uh, one that's currently ha happening at Valley High School, a regional school of ours. Uh, a, a local group called Improve Your Tomorrow has really taken great strides in finding um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I think 30 seconds is a little too short. Uh, <laughs> let's try 45 seconds for this question. Uh, 
How accountable should teachers be to parents directly? How will increased accountability work within the district chain of command? Uh, Mike, you're up first on this one. I think uh, a, a part, every education process has to have a, uh, a, a good communication between the teacher and the parent on behalf of the child. I think if the dispute arises, uh, that uh, the, uh, the way to handle that is to um, go up through to the principal, to the, to the, up through the, uh, uh, um, the uh, up through the chain of command, I want to say. The, the, the teachers, though, have a uh, important job to try to, they see the whole, the whole issue. And um, I hope that they would be, and I expect that they would uh, give the parents what Thank they need. Thank you. Okay, Bob. Well, obviously the, the teacher-parent uh, interaction is critical. I guess when it uh, gets to the point of, uh, you know, a problem uh, between a teacher and parent, I think that there has to be absolutely clear-cut policies and procedures for handling that. And uh, that's, a, that's a problem. I've talked to a lot of teachers that they're not sure what the policies and procedures are for handling complaints. So I would think that would be a very important thing to delineate. Thank you. Chuck. Um, I would see it primarily as a time management issue for the teachers. I think uh, if, if you're monitoring and reporting um, as you go and uh, keeping the, the parents surprised before something comes to a head, uh, I think uh, that's going to end up saving the, the teacher and the parents more time in the long run and then they'll be able to use that time uh, teaching and, and doing other things for the, all the students' benefits. Madhavi. So we talked a lot about how we've disinvested in our public infrastructure and in our schools. We, uh, now we're asking teachers to take care of mental health issues, to uh, ad administer EpiPens, and yet they're the first people that we blame when there's a problem. So I think that we need to make sure that we have structures that protect the interests of teachers. There are systems in place and we need to review them and be clear about them. But in terms of accountability, that's the school board. The school board are your elected representatives. Parents should reach out to school board members and school board members need to respond by email or phone call or having coffees and that kind of thing. Um, but there is a chain where the teachers answer to principals, principals answer to the superintendent. Um, but in terms of Thank accountability, you. this is the time, this election. Okay, Tom. I just want to say that, first of all, um, a successful uh, education of any child depends upon the relationship between the parent and the teacher. And so that is a built-in accountability there. In terms of me, a school board member, intervening down to the classroom level, I would not do that for the simple reason that it would be a dangerous thing. I would make sure, though, I would talk to the school if there was a, dan if it was a situation of conflict and make sure that, you know, everyone got around to uh, talking about the issue, but the reality is this. Most of our problems can be solved if we actually sit down and talk to each other as, as adults and do so in a manner that's respectful. I just want to remind everybody the question is how accountable should teachers be to parents? Barbara. Um, I've never really heard it framed that teachers are accountable to parents. I think teachers are accountable to students. Teachers are accountable to their principals. Um, I, I realize that, you know, K-6, certainly there is a very close relationship between, you know, families and their classroom teacher. Um, and then, you know, as, as kids goes on, 7 through 12, um, you know, then they're more independent. So um, uh, I don't know that really teachers are accountable to parents. Okay. Alan. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I tend to agree with that. Teachers, at the end of the day, are accountable to students. You know. Um, there are a lot of students in this community who may not have two parents. They may have one parent. They might have no parents. They might be raised by a guardian. They might be raised by a grandparent. So truly, um, I think that the, the issue of the question was, should teachers be accountable to students? And the an answer to that is absolutely. And it's ultimately the board who, uh, uh, you know, is the final arbiter, if you will, and, and decision maker with regard to whether or not teachers are, uh, in fact, uh, doing their job. But uh, I, I've never met a teacher who uh, isn't in it for the love of it and is a professional in knowing what, how to Thank reach you. their students. Okay, Jose, you get the last word on this one. 
As a teacher, I would feel uh, uncomfortable even preparing classes thinking what the parents are going to say. <laughs> my, my important thing is to see what I, what I need to tell the students and what they need to learn. I think that relationship, however, we cannot leave the parents out. It needs to have, a, we need to have meetings where the expectations and the duties are well delineated and they understand. They can't be like happens at soccer, and you know, so probably some of you might have been at my soccer games when I'm a referee, you know, where they shout from the sides what the referee should do or so on. That can't be with the teachers. I think you, you, you have to delineate the rules, what they are, and I, the teachers need Thank to have you. confidence. In them. Okay, folks, this is the very last question I will ask tonight. Bob, you will start. Um, do you have any special interests you represent, such as gate, sports, antagonism towards teachers, <laughs> opposed to tenure, or various other things? Uh, one minute each. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I think uh, I'm here to represent uh, all our kids, and that's my main goal, and to try and meet their uh, individual needs. Okay, thank you. Chuck? Uh, my answer is no. My kids are in particular programs, but that doesn't mean I advocate primarily or solely on behalf of those programs. So uh, being on the board is about representing all the kids and making sure, sure that they get the services they need to meet their particular needs. Thank you. Madhavi. I've always stood up for all people. The work that I've done in the 1990s, I began writing about gay rights and I'm not gay. I fought for Muslim women's rights and I'm not Muslim. And I believe that that's what every school board trustee is, should be fighting for all children and their right to an education. Thank you. Tom. I don't represent any special interest. And just want to say that for me, all students, educating all students means that all students, because all means all, and that's all what all means. <laughs> Barbara? No, uh, I don't represent any special interests, and I'm interested um, in making this the best district we can for 8,600 kids. Alan. No. Jose? Yes, I, I represent uh, two special interests, the students and the taxpayers. And for that reason, I am against the sale of the property. On the, I want to announce today that as a candidate, I'll be opposed to the sale of the grande property because that belongs to the students and belongs to the taxpayers. And I would like to see the alternatives on what that land gets developed as opposed to selling it for building houses with no plan where to spend the money. Okay, Mike, you get the last say. In a, in a minute, I'll just say that uh, the, um, the board can't have any hidden agendas, and we can't have any, uh, a, a person can't have an ax to grind as a board member. You have to uh, be uh, completely fair and honest. Um, going, this question dovetails of the last one. My kids, uh, when they were in uh, elementary school, there were a few teachers they didn't like at all. They were very, they didn't like them at all. And now they've graduated, I've heard them talk and said, you know, they were pretty good teachers. <laughs> and so uh, when you take a longer view, you can see that there's a, there's, there's a, um, a strong uh, education effort here that we have to preserve. So I would say, uh, no, I don't have any hidden agendas. I don't, uh, don't want to do anything like that. My, uh, my purpose is my kids went to neighborhood schools. They didn't go to any special programs. But I believe that a board member has to hope, pull those different programs together and work as one uh, unit to advance our school district. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, I neglected to thank uh, one group, and they uh, very generously uh, provided the drinks and the refreshments, and that's uh, the Davis Phoenix Coalition and Gloria Partida. <laughs> and once again, uh, I want to thank uh, all eight of uh, the Davis Joint Unified School Board candidates for their time and commitment. And thank you, Davis Media Access, one more time, and have a good evening, everybody.